Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming here, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank very, 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 very much Mosaic Room and the Qattan Foundation for hosting this beautiful event here. Uh, the, Qattan, the Qattan family is a very close family to our family. So it's, uh, we're like, you know, we're home. So it's good. It's a good start. Second, I would love to say hi to everybody, one by one especially that lovely gentleman here, my dad's best, best friend. He flew from Beirut to be with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, because of Mr. Azam Amu Bishar, this book is made. So, thank you. I would like to welcome first Mr. Martin Rosen, who doesn't know Martin. Check his Twitter, seriously. <laughs> he is a beautiful satirist, cartoonist for The Guardian, and he is a very big voice for actually freedom of speech in general. <laughs> any journalist, any cartoonist in trouble, there's Martin there <laughs> helping. <laughs> so it's not only a cartoonist inside the office, he's a cartoonist in real life. He's a person who makes his work real and changes on the ground. So thank you, Martin, for accepting this beautiful invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And well, thank you for inviting me. I'm actually very honored uh, to be asked to this event to uh, celebrate your published work. Uh, um, because as a British cartoonist, I mean, you know what the English are like. We think we're special. We think we're exceptional. We think nobody else does cartoons except us. We think that with William Hogarth, we invented cartoons. Of course, that's absolutely untrue. Um, I think that visual satire, what I did, what I do, what Cahill did, is actually central to being human. We have to laugh at our leaders to stop us going mad. And if you want to see where human civilization started, it started in the Middle East. If you want to see the first cartoon, look at Anubis, the jackal-headed god of the ancient Egyptians. I don't want to cause any offence to any adherence to the religions of the ancient Egyptians, but uh, it's a small step from the DNA of Anubis, the jackal-headed god of the ancient Egyptians, to Goofy, the dog-headed cartoon character created by Walt Disney. Um, and um, nonetheless, I'm going to big up what I do, uh, to a certain extent, uh, as, as a British cartoonist, um, because we can claim one thing which is that in this country, we have had over 300 years of cartoons being more or less left alone by the political elite. Uh, that they worked out quite early on, they rather liked being drawn because it fed their vanity. And in other unhappier parts of the world, or happier parts of the world, I think you'll find the governments tend to kill the cartoonists and put the cartoonists in prison. They're Last year, I helped uh, Musa Kart in Turkey, who was being threatened with 10 years in prison for the way he draws the Turkish president. Uh, at the moment, there is an Iranian cartoonist who's in prison uh, for 12 and a half years for drawing Iranian MPs as cows and monkeys. Uh, and on it goes and on it goes. And we all know about Ali Fazat, who had his fingers broken by Assad's thugs in Syria three years ago. Um, in this country, our politicians don't do that but only because they've yet to work out how they can get away with doing that. Um, one of the reasons they can't do that is because we've had stuff like this for over 300 years. This is by the great James Gilray, who died 200 years ago at the beginning of last month, uh, so on the 1st of June, two, uh, 1815, just before the Battle of Waterloo. And it's what all cartoonists do. This is the sort of type specimen. This is the template of what we do. We take recognizable people, we twist them through the magic of caricature to turn them into puppets in our control, and then we set them up in a ludicrous narrative. And you look at any cartoon anywhere around the world, that's exactly what we always do all the time. And I've been doing this job now for 33 years. I've been working in newspapers for 28 of those years. And what I deal with is I deal with the news, and I deal with the unfolding horror of uh, the everyday. And inevitably, quite a lot of that has involved over those 30 years, the Middle East. It's been the sort of growling, elephant trumpeting 
in the corner and dealing with the news you have to deal with. This is a very early cartoon I did for Time Out um, at the time of the first uh, Gulf War after the invasion of Q Kuwait and it's the three of the four horsemen of the apocalypse you know and they're saying at last here's pestilence with the CNN crew and if you remember that war it was the first cable TV war and my wife and I made a conscious decision not to watch the TV news because I thought this is just an arms fair on TV for the American aerospace industry. Um, this was done at more or less the same time, the Grim Reaper cancelling the milk. And this figure of the Grim Reaper appears over and over again, looking at the, the horrors going on, where you think there might be some hope. This is from 1993, uh, when the Israel and the PLO finally recognize each other. They sort of pull off the caricatures to sort of see the human beings underneath. But of course, that didn't last very long. Um, but there's the Dove of Peace. There's the Grim Reaper constantly bobbing and weaving. And so there are Middle East peace processes, uh, and they are interspersed with peace processes in Northern Ireland. And here's Blair with his peace pigeon actually getting Yasser Arafat and Netanyahu to dress up as a Northern Irish Protestant and a member of the IRA, because it worked for them, so it might work in uh, Israel-Palestine as well. And, uh, of course, there's also the biblical element. Just to make things even worse, let's throw religion into this mess as well. And there's the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This is Sharon throwing his brain at Gaza. Um, this is uh, a pretty particularly brutal cartoon from 2008, um, eye for eye, tooth for tooth latest. Um, this is from last year. Um, where somebody's saying to Netanyahu, I'm sorry to bother you, boss, but now the terrorists are claiming they're about to run out of milk teeth with the number of children who were killed in Gaza last year. Um, and uh, you sometimes feel, you know, the amount of horror going on, the amount of death going on, who are the real combatants here? Who is, who is fighting against who? Uh, this was at the time of the incursion into Lebanon in um, 2006, uh, where... Uh, Condoleezza Rice, representing the Americans, is then talking to the Iranians and the Syrians uh, as the dogs fight over the pile of corpses. Um, that's based on this famous cartoon by the great 20th century New Zealand cartoonist who actually worked in this country uh, for most of his career, David Lowe, where Hitler met Stalin over the slain corpse of Poland at the beginning of the Second World War. Um, and throughout these decades of me covering this topic, uh, one thing has been constant. One thing has been absolutely guaranteed every time I do a cartoon about anything to do with Israel-Palestine or Israel and the wider Middle East, that I will receive hundreds, if not thousands, of emails telling me I have created the most anti-Semitic cartoon since the closure of Der Sturm. <laughs> Always the same. Always the same, and this is disgracefully offensive. I, there are a few death threats thrown in there as well, but I always say that a death threat that comes by email doesn't really count. You need one of your children's, <laughs> need one of your children's ears and an envelope sent to your home address with a stamp on it. Um, and there is, in fact, uh, we're particularly lucky on the Guardian that there is a website dedicated to teasing out the slightest hint homeopathically tiny hint of anti-Semitism in anything appearing in The Guardian. It's run by a man called Adam Levick. Uh, it's called CIF Watch. He's based in New York, not in Tel Aviv, which I find is quite interesting. And every time a cartoon appears by me or Steve Bell on an Israeli subject, uh, he will leap on us and say, this is the most disgracefully anti-Semitic cartoon since the closure of Desh Derma, every single time. And after a while, I thought I'd start playing with him. Well, I mean, I tweeted last year that I was no longer going to do any cartoons about Israel because I was going to starve them of the oxygen of publicity. And he's, he, he then sort of replied on Twitter, said, ah, oh, Rosen admits he's given up. He's given up. So, oh, well done. I thought you believed in freedom of speech, Adam. And he's, oh, no, 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 I do, I do. You're allowed to say whatever you like, except you're not allowed to say what I don't like and all the usual nonsense. But this one was drawn, if you remember, when there was a flotilla of Turkish boats that were seeking to break the blockade of Gaza. And so the uh, Israelis have landed on Noah's Ark and squashed the peace pigeon. Uh, the dove of peace, as usual. Um, it was clearly intent on pecking innocent civilians, so the usual weasel words of the Israeli lobby. Um, Levick then started commenting below the line on the Guardian website, saying this was an anti-Semitic cartoon. It was a disgracefully anti-Semitic cartoon. It was the most grossly anti-Semitic cartoon since the closure of Der Sturmer, because it was taking a Jewish myth 
So you're not allowed to look at, you know, so, so, so that makes it anti-Semitic. Well, I, and I thought, actually, I'm going to play with this bloke because I'm getting a bit pissed off with this. So I said, well, actually, I think you'll find to be strictly precise that Noah was, was before Abraham, so technically he wasn't actually a Jew. <laughs> wasn't having that. So no, 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 it's absolutely disgraceful. Absolutely, it's, it's quite clearly meant to be anti-Semitic because you have specifically and deliberately cited animals mentioned in the Bible. And I'd thought of this beforehand, so I had quite deliberately chosen certain animals. So I'm just going to point them out to you. You see, uh, there's a walrus up there, an aardvark, a beaver, there's a llama, um, there's a gorilla, and there's also uh, an okapi. There's an okapi in there. So I said, all right, Adam. I want you to give me literally the biblical chapter and verse where the following animals are mentioned. <laughs> Walruses, aardvarks, llamas, and the okapi, first described to science in 1903. <laughs> at which point he replied, that is irrelevant. To which I replied, no, no, the elephant's at the back. Anyway, but it's a cheap joke, but I was, enjoyed it. But it's weird that I've never had any complaints from any Arab countries or any Arabs, for that matter, about my cartoons, but always that you're not allowed to say anything. You're never allowed to say there might be two sides to these conflicts. And there was one cartoon I did about, uh, it was a very brutal cartoon I did at the time of the disastrous incursion into Lebanon in 2006, which actually led to the resignation of Tony Blair, so it had one good side, um, where the Israeli ambassador had a letter published in The Guardian which started off with a dictionary definition of what a political cartoon is, and said, according to these lights, what Mar Martin Rosen's effort wasn't a political cartoon. So he was saying, I didn't like that, so it doesn't actually exist. Weird stuff, weird stuff. <laughs> my God, <laughs> they're here already, <laughs> they're listening to my every word, I know. I know. Um, anyway. The horror continues to unfold. We thought there'd be some hope after the uh, Arab Spring, but in terms, we ended up with Sisi in Egypt. So, you know, this is the riddle of the Sphinx. So when is a democracy not a democracy, a coup not a coup, and a massacre not a massacre? Who cares? Uh, here is the Arab autumn following on from the Arab Spring. And sometimes I try and get a gag out of it. Sometimes you actually have got to laugh, because the purpose of us, the purpose of me, the purpose of Cahill was to tease laughter out of tragedy. To paraphrase Karl Marx, tragedy repeated as laughter, as farce. To make it bearable, otherwise we would actually go insane with the horror of it all. That's why we have evolved the capacity for laughter, to make it bearable. And it's our job to laugh, not just at our leaders, but also at the horrific things they do. So this was, uh, this was after 9-11, this was um, the... Uh, in, Af in Afghanistan, and I did this. This is the Christmas cover for Tribune magazine. Um, hey, Osama, a Santa, so what's the difference? So, um, and nonetheless, you just carry on doing things. And I did this cartoon in 2002, after I'd been covering this story for nearly 20 years, on and off, because it's been going on for far, far longer than that, and it will carry on going on. Um, and it was just showing my, my sort of weary slightly cynical despair of the Grim Reapers, two of them playing snooker, Israeli retaliation top pocket. I hate to say it, but I'm get, beginning to get slightly bored with this game. It was only when I saw this book of Cahill's work that I realized I had unconsciously stolen this idea. And I was delighted that he got there first. <laughs> a truly great cartoonist, and it is a genuine honor to be here to honor him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Have a seat, have a seat. Now we would like to welcome Malou. Malou, Malou? Malou Halasa. Uh, Malou can introduce herself, I suppose. Uh, but Malou is a great publisher, and she's working a lot in satire, I think, a lot regarding satire. I'm, I'm very interested in satire. Yeah. Um, you can... My name's Malou Halasa. I'm an editor and writer in London. My father's Jordanian, my mother's Filipino. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's the mix. It's the, the Good parties, I should think. Good, great parties, great parties. Um, 
No, I have a, a, a real interest in satire, a real interest in cartooning. Yeah. But we'll get to that later. I'm going to just ask a couple of questions yeah. to our the, our to our guests here, and um, yeah. well, uh, when we'll take set different. and then we'll open it up <laughs> for discussion with the audience. Martin, one of the first things I wanted to ask you know is that there's no real toolkit for editorial cartoonists. But if there if there was a toolkit, what does an what does an insightful, you know, um, exciting, visually articulate editorial cartoonist need? Uh, well, I'll answer that um, in a roundabout way, as you expect. I won't give you a direct answer. In the mid '90s, I discovered that there um, was a university in the West Midlands that was offering a degree course in cartoon and caricature. This is when you still had student grants. Uh, and, and I thought this is an absolutely disgraceful idea to teach people for three years how to do editorial cartoons. What they needed to do was to get the grant, drink it, <laughs> turn up to no lectures, no supervisions, no seminars, and drop out after about five weeks, and then they'd be perfectly qualified to be a cartoonist. Um, that's what you need. Uh, the reason why this is actually, I think, the most vibrant, popular art, for, visual art form on the planet, which it is, it's just nobody ever dares admit it, um, is because specifically it works so well in newspapers. Let's see how it thrives on the internet, but it specifically works in newspapers because it is a point of anarchy, a visual anarchy. It works very well in, in broadsheet newspapers where you have a very dull layout and you've got this madness happening. But it also, I always also think of the editorial cartoon as a place where the subversive narrative is yeah. celebrated. Like everywhere else in public space, everything is kind of, you know, tied down. You're not really allowed to have that subversion or anarchy to come in. But there's also, um, I, I'm, sadly I can't remember the name of the cartoonist, but uh, I was told about this by Cal, a uh, great cartoonist for the Baltimore Sun. Uh, in America in 1980, the cartoonist were a, a, a regional American newspaper whose cartoon was right next to the editorial column. The editorial column came out in favor of Reagan. And so his cartoon next to this was him just going like that. And it's perfect because, you know, um, if the editor says, you're not doing that, he said, well, what's the point of me then? As I've been saying to editors for 30 years, you know, I'm not here to illustrate your editorial. I'm, I'm a sort of visual columnist. I'm a point of anarchy, you know. A, vi a visual columnist, a visual yeah, journalist. Yeah, yeah. Um, the treatment of Arab cartoonists at their newspapers and publications <coughs> being published inside and outside of uh, outside the region is a kind of litmus test. Uh, you know, too often Arab cartoonists at home endure terrible censorship or they're attacked or they're jailed or they're threatened with imprisonment. And not even living abroad um, allows them to be safe. When we think of the Palestinian cartoonist Naji Al Ali, who's gone down near Sloan Square in 1987. Your father, he also worked in exile and he left Beirut for good in 1978. Mm -hmm. And he was published regularly by leading pan-Arab newspapers and magazines in London, but also by the, the international press, by the Wall Street Journal and the Independent. Um, and it was interesting that his cartoon spoke to a wide range of people. Mm -hmm. It spoke to the Arab intellectual, but also it spoke to the ordinary people. And I was sort of curious from his experience, you know, um, this idea that there seem to be these movable goalposts of, uh, for freedom of expression in the Arab world. Sometimes you're able to get away with things, sometimes you weren't able. Can you talk about that in regards to your father's work? Well, being able to draw in something like the pan-Arab Saudi, Arab Sharq al-Awsat and Arab news, there are lines not to cross. But as Martin usually says as well, that you kind of self-censor yourself. You start learning your business. You know how to get your message in another way. Hence makes you a bit more creative because you kind of not use words anymore. You kind of create a, a character that nobody will know who it is. And the only problem with him was if he draws a Libyan person, mm -hmm. the paper might stop printing in Libya. So it's a business issue. So what do they do? Okay, do what you want, but don't be too offensive or open. He's like, fine, I'll offend that character. <laughs> so he created the Arab globe, 
Yeah, they're, they're, and the Arab globe came yeah, very early. The Arab world as, as a man with a globe. And the big mustache. And the big mustache. <laughs> and the Arab globe is actually was born. He came here around October, September, October 78. By January, he had the globe. So he was like, OK, I'm <laughs> going to have to create something so I can move on. And, but he always used to say, I can get away with it if I draw it in a way that I want the people who will understand it get it. And the people who won't, I'll put them just a little word here. Like, he would be upset that he's using words. But sometimes for a bigger audience, he would need to spice it up. Can you tell us like a, fer a favorite memory that you might have of, of your father at work? At work? Yeah, I, you know, drawing or, or... Unfortunately, I grew up away from You grew up away from him. I grew up in Lebanon, but he grew up here. But there is one thing that was very clear in our relationship, that he was very close to his family. And we were always in touch. And he would tell us all about his work all the time. He would send pictures, no, there's he would a send marvelous, us interviews. There's a marvelous so we lived in through book. him yeah. in archives, yeah. letters, uh, tapes. tapes. He, would, he tapes. would record tapes for us. He would send us letters. And so we grew with him, if you want, digitally now. But not digitally, like data sent to us, but through him. And a lot of it, a lot of it, like he was a storyteller. So we would know how his office looks. We know everything about him. Like when he passed away, and it was the first time I walked into his office, it was like, ooh, I know it so well. Like the, he had like a sand timer, which is always in his cartoons. He had all the cartoons around. I was like, I know this so much. I, I know the man so well. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's interesting. In that Why did you decide to do the book with your brother? Why did the family want you to compile the book? I mean, there's a reason, of course. It's, it's family, family and friends, but uh, it is when he passed away, we gathered all his work. And it just went to storage for many years. And I am a filmmaker. I'm a storyteller. I'm a film editor, actually, so I edit image. And my brother is a, is a computer engineer, kind of coder guy who would do like the database of, you know, coming from nowhere. And it's like tagging and all this. So we mix that thing together with all his friends around us who are pushing us to make this book, saying, where are the cartoons? We're like, in storage. What are they doing in storage? So we were What's like, we were just trying to start a life, but now, yeah, now we can do it. It was time. We matured. We, um, we, you know, we, we kind of passed that time of passing and that he passed and left us. And now it was starting to think, like, sink in. What am I going to do? Are they going to just stay in storage like that? What, what, Your father what must happens have, if something happens to me? He must Nobody's going to know about all these cartoons. He must have done thousands of cartoons. What yeah. was the, the selection process like? How were you able exactly. to? Exactly. The selection process comes in the scanning business. Because we scanned every single cartoon, that is actually a very interesting project because of this project, is the scanning. And the scanning came with my brother creating this amazing digital bank that has tagging for artwork. So we started scanning, numbering the cartoons, putting the numbers in the database, and got somebody who was into politics and cartoons who tagged all the cartoons, all the characters, all the stories, Oslo Accord, Reagan, Thatcher, John Major. There are people we didn't even know. We had to run to people and say, who is this person in 1973? I mean, we don't even know who it is. We can see the story, but we don't know who it is. So we went through this for two and a half years, just tagging. Well, and I'm after tagging, that goes easy. You press Palestine. <laughs> you get everything. <laughs> it's called digital. <laughs> so yeah, and that's how it works. Can you say, how many, um, how many cartoons did you have to scan? Or? A lot. A lot. Okay. <laughs> thousands upon thousands. <laughs> Hello. It, it, look, uh, you know, it's 23, 24 years in Britain. He draws every day, yeah. Arabic and English. And he had the previous work in Lebanon, and he had colored cartoons once a week. Yeah. So he created a cartoon a day. That's 
So it's, it's we get, uh, That's we needed a digital thing. So let's talk briefly <laughs> about the modus operandi of editorial cartooning, which Martin, you've called visual journalism. And I'm very curious like about, well, I've, I've read that you've called it visual journalism. I asked him. Yes, oh good, good, you looked at me, I thought, <laughs> oh my god, putting words in his mouth. But can you tell me where your ideas come from? I mean, is it, does something piss you off? And then you said, ah, oh, I'm gonna write it this way or draw it this way, or is it an image or is it, or is it like? It's, I mean, it's interesting, because apart from the people sending me death threats, um, I get people quite often sending me ideas for cartoons. And you know, oh, I sort of gently point out to them, I'm the cartoonist and they should stick to their day job. Because, <laughs> uh, but uh, they say, you know, why don't you do a cartoon about this? Why don't you do a cartoon about that? But of course, it doesn't work like that. I'm a journalist, I work for a daily newspaper and I have to deal with the news. Mm -hmm. So I may feel <clears throat> extremely angry or extremely inspired about a news story, which if it isn't one of the top three headline stories, I can't deal with it because there is a chance that my readers won't have any idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago, uh, a cartoonist on a paper I was then working for got terribly excited about a story on page 27 of a tabloid paper about a kangaroo breaking into a supermarket in Australia. And I said, <coughs> it would be absolutely perfect if anybody had ever heard of this story, and they haven't. Unless it's, run, unless it's one of the top three stories on the BBC News, you can't deal with it. So, so there's that discipline. Uh, there's then you've got to sort of go for the hunch, is this story going to be big enough to run? Is it going to make any sense tomorrow? Um, sometimes, I mean, I realised after doing this for so long that actually the, the news is like a dog. Um, it's genuinely like a dog. Sometimes it uh, is worrying at a bone. So all this week will be Greece. It'll be Greece next week. Arr, worrying away at it. Sometimes it gets over excited and runs around, sniffs about all over the place, and then sort of runs around somewhere else. And it can't decide what it's, it, what it's going to be. So the story might change. You file the cartoon, then the story changes completely. And you think, oh God, I've missed that. And of course you can do nothing about it. And sometimes, genuinely, I know in this 24-hour rolling news world in which we're compelled to live, they won't let you say this, but sometimes actually the news dog falls to sleep and absolutely nothing happens. Absolutely nothing at all happens. We say, well, something must be happening somewhere. But if you listen to the news on certain occasions, you'll find that 90% of it is uh, talking about what is going to happen. The Prime Minister will make a speech. The Chancellor of the Exchequer will turn in for an election. You know, whatever, whatever is going to happen. And uh, either that or they are analysing things. Or something happens and then they analyse it to death. Uh, so, I mean, recently Sky News wanted to get me in the studio with Quentin Letts, and I said, I don't want to be in the studio with Quentin Letts, but they wanted me to talk about Cameron's decision that he wouldn't serve a full second term. And I really didn't want to do this, and they were going to send a van, and they were going to film me at home in the studio, and I just really didn't want this to happen. And then they rang up and said, oh, we're so sorry, we're so sorry this can't happen, uh, there's been a plane crash in France. Uh, and uh, those poor people who died in that plane crash, that's terribly sad. But I actually knew that then they had one thing to report and they were going to cover it obsessively for the next 24 hours with nothing to say. <laughs> At least we do stupid drawings, you know, so we respond to it in that way. Yeah, so it's interesting, like, your process is very similar, I think, to your father's process. I, I'm going to read a quote by um, the noted Iranian journalist and editor, Amir Tahiri, who wrote that Mahmoud Kahil liked to work on his own, never attended editorial meetings, his editors quickly understood that they couldn't tell him what to do and what not to do. To keep abreast of what was going on, Cahill did a great deal of reading and often held discussions with journalists who covered the events. In his work, he always left a little bit of the curtain unopened and introduced a small raven on the margins or a crow on the margins, perhaps a tongue-in-cheek reminder that the worst was yet to come. Um, I wanted to ask you about, is there any, uh, we talked about the crow before. Yeah. The crow is, is a symbol that came and left. So it yes. came in the 80s and left at the end of the 80s. So it was a decade of crow. And I think my lovely daddy friend would be more helpful later <laughs> if you ask him, because he lived the crow coming and going. But what he would tell me all I can tell you that the crow represented himself. But then in about two years time, he told me I stopped doing this crow because it jinxed me. Everything I know is not right. Financially, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, the crow was a jinx. So was the crow a, a, a um, 
Was it an optimistic symbol, a pessimistic symbol? It's an active symbol in the cartoon. It's, it's his opinion, but yeah, as a jinx, it just it's, turned uh, on If you look at the, uh, he has so many different, different clothes. clothes. One of them with long, one of them is with the needles. Against they would carry, the, the, the crow would carry things. Everyone meant something else, uh, represented an issue, yeah. a subject. A subject. So I was I was going to ask both of you to talk about uh, Cahill's uh, you know visual vocabulary because I found it very interesting this idea that you know we talked about the Arab world as a man with a globe then there was I think the the, the archetypal Lebanese with the tarbouch and the big mustache. mustache but also there were there are many you know the way that. You know, even how Ariel Sharon was yeah. depicted, you know, always, of course, big and flabby as he was, but, you know, his gluttony would enter into the cartoons yeah. also. And even though your father didn't really like um, Princess Diana that much, he did a very mm -hmm. special cartoon of a, of a big heart with the uh, British flag, yeah, but part of it had been, like, yeah. fractured and broken away. Yeah, I didn't like uh, getting so much attention. I think that's his problem. I, I think I'm, but I liked your father. We would have agreed on many No, but times. I wouldn't go into the technical side of it, but I would talk from the way I scanned all the years up to the end. Yes, I've seen a massive change in his lines. Uh, we found, you will see a video that will roll while you're having your drinks and food. There are footage, very rare footage we found in 1967 of Cahir drawing live. And uh, you would see the lines, like even magazines that we found in the, in the boot fairs or in Lebanon in galleries, and you would look at them and say, it is him, but the noses have changed, you know? Like Arafat used to be a bit taller. He shrunk, you know, like his nose got taller, but he shrunk, you know? There are little bits that he kind of aesthetically fixed through the years. But yeah, I don't know, the thing, something... But the thing is, you, 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 do, you develop all the time. Yeah, you? so there um, is a... But it's, it's you um, to understand. I mean, you saw earlier on the cartoon I did of, uh, of Blair trying to bring the, the Northern Ireland peace process to the Middle East. Um, I totally changed the way I drew Blair after 9-11, mm -hmm. because he suddenly got sort of terribly gaunt and statesman like you know. He still had the mad teeth and the mad eyes and the big ears, mm -hmm. but, but he started changing. And um, I've always drawn Cameron as Little Lord Fauntleroy, because he is Little Lord Fauntleroy. Uh, but he used to be a, a, an adult dressed up as a, yeah. a Victorian child. He is now a Victorian child. I've made him small. <laughs> he's, shrunk, he's shrunk in office. And um, Plontu, the cartoonist with, yes. with, with Le Mans, told me, um, which, which is a wonderful story, which actually gets to the heart of what cartoonists should do, that he used to draw Sarkozy as very short, or Sarkozy is very short. And every day he appeared, every time he drew Sarkozy on the front page of Le Mans, Sarkozy would ring up the editor and complain. <laughs> and every time Sarkozy complained, Plantu would make him smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and it carried on until Sarkozy was just shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and Plantu made it quite clear that he was doing this because Sarkozy was complaining to the editor. And Sarkozy carried on complaining to the editor. And which is absolutely perfectly describes the relationship between politicians and cartoonists. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, some of your father's cartoons are very critical when it came to Arab leaders and, and what they were up mm -hmm. to. Uh, but then, you know, when we, were t we had a conversation before, we were talking about well, some leaders like to see themselves in cartoons and they, they kind of get insulted if they're, they're left out. I'm sort of wondering, like, when did you and your brother become aware that maybe your father, well, your father had an interesting and unusual job, but when did you guys become aware that maybe what he was doing was dangerous or that everyone kind of had to watch? I'll tell you something, was? you know, um, he was a very careful man. He wasn't a cartoonist who was way beyond the lines of, like, he wouldn't touch religion, sexuality. There are things that he, in his own ethics, as a Lebanese man he was, he had his own... Red line. Yeah, his ethics. I'll yeah. go all the way with wars and, and uh, arms and like a lot on arms, a lot of deprivation, Africa, poverty. So he did the human right thing rather than all the other bits, the taboos that yeah. he wants to break totally to make a statement. But when, when Najil Ali was killed, yeah. it was becoming a bit... Uh, worrying because they said on the news in Lebanon 
an Arab cartoonist was shot dead in London. And, and we were maybe in a shelter at the time. So we were panicking until we got the news that it's not him, it's not Jali. And I started uh, being aware that what he's doing is actually very dangerous. And, and hence I got into my own human rights work and stuff. So I started realizing and all these, um, uh, you know, um, helping the journalists around. And I got with this, with my dad being alive, I was already helping in NGOs for freedom of speech, with index on censorship. Uh, well, you know, but it says that the danger and that your father uh, but he kept face. his red lines. He kept his red lines, but did he ever talk to you and your brother about that? In terms he, of he used to say, you know, like his editor-in-chief would not, would publish it, but he would tell him, can you take like two weeks holiday from tomorrow, please? You know, they're like, disappear. Have some repeats now for the next 10 days. Oh, so they, they would have had a phone call, a slap, they had to deal with it, with all the people around. So he was like, can you have a bit of a holiday? Because they can't tell him not to draw. Like, yeah. He wouldn't do it, you know, he's gonna keep on drawing. So he would do something when he comes back, shouting more. So, but uh, interestingly, with the president, yes, he had leaders who would call and say, I want this cartoon. After they were like massacred in the cartoon. It's like, why do you want this cartoon? He's like, it's me. Yeah, he well, can tell you about the well, it's, story. Well, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a story I, I, I uh, heard from uh, a Palestinian cartoonist called Baha Buhari, who, um, was, who works for a Fatah paper in Ramallah. And he went with the PLO into exile to Kuwait. And he did a cartoon of a Kuwaiti minister. And one night, he got a knock on his door. You know, knocks on the door at the night in the middle of the night, not good. And uh, he opened the door, and there were these men with guns who said, "You come with us now." And he had been summoned by the brother of the minister, of the Kuwaiti minister, and he was put into a car which was full of more men with guns, and driven off into the desert, uh, where they ended up at this huge house, which was guarded by lots of men with guns. <laughs> and they went. He went into the hall, and in the middle of the sort of vast lobby of this huge house in the middle of the desert was a Bedouin tent <laughs> surrounded by men with guns <laughs> and he went into it and standing in the middle of the Bedouin tent loaded up with guns was the minister's brother who said are you the man who drew that cartoon of my brother and Baha said, shit I'm going to die I have all these people with guns are going to kill me now and it was, well, there's no point in lying he said yes yes I, I did that cartoon of my brother is there a problem is it why haven't you done one of me? <laughs> so that summarizes everything. They yeah. actually like it. It's like they have to be in the news. If yeah. they are yeah. in a cartoon, they're more popular. If they're not in a cartoon, oops, well, I it's, need it's, to kill a couple of I mean, it's, people. It's, it's always been said that one thing for a politician anywhere, actually, yeah. probably even in North Korea, <laughs> the one thing worse than being in a cartoon is not being in a cartoon because it means you're insufficiently important or recognisable. Yeah. Uh, and I've had problems, you know, so some new politician comes along and I have no idea what they look like, but neither has my readers got any idea what they look like. John Hutton, he was a senior <laughs> minister. Don't ask me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's remarkable about also uh, the book, it, what's remarkable about the cartoons in the book is that the cartoons, although they were drawn at a very specific time, they are very relevant to what's going on today. Oh. Now, we've talked about this. I'd like us now to talk about prophecy. I mean, editorial cartoons. Are the cartoons of your father so good because the issues then are the issues now? Or is, it, yeah. is that, if that's Absolutely. what it is? That they're we very haven't tiny. changed? In the last 20 years, nothing changed in the Arab world. So mm. that, that's why all those old ones he has done in the 70s, late 70s, and still are the same now. Like the same words. Would appreciate them. Would oh, definitely, definitely would appreciate them. And actually, that the, even though they were drawn then, they provide very good insight about what's going on now. So that's, but I was sort of curious about your work. Like, do you feel somehow that, you, you know, you're yeah, prophetic, you you've got this power to so <laughs> sort of see, the, or, or the world doesn't no, really change. Um, so no, 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 well, um, Although I am politically not a reactionary, my work is entirely reactionary because I always have to react to events. And I uh, 
depicts these people in ridiculous ways because they deserve it. Um, and there's a large part of me which would like things to turn out in such a way that I would be completely redundant. That we'd live in a peaceful, happy, equal world where um, you wouldn't need me. Um, we haven't got to that point yet. But it was like in, in 2004 when every fibre of my being wanted Bush to lose for the good of the world, for the good of America, for the good of everywhere. Um, except this rather overactive satire gland bobbing on the back of my neck. Saying, yeah, say, yeah. say, hang, hang on, hang on, you really love drawing his eyebrows like mad chinchillas <laughs> running around his forehead. And my colleague Steve Bell on The Guardian, I don't know if you know, used to draw John Major, the British Prime Minister, with his underpants on the outside of his trousers as a kind of crap <laughs> superman. And he was wearing these air checks underpants which were full of holes. And I, in 97, I rang up and said, Steve, what do you think about that Labour landslide victory? He said, I've lost my reason for living, because he just loved doing the holes in the <laughs> other <underwear. laughs> And we do. I mean, George Osborne, I think, should be, have his head bolted to a dungeon wall for the rest of time. I love drawing so much. Mm. I just love drawing. And, it's, and we develop this weird kind of relationship. Mm. And, they, and they sort of rather love it as well, because it means that well, they're in the public eye. They're but, now but, and, we, and we develop this kind of a mutually abusive relationship. <laughs> were you surprised when you were scanning how, um, to de how uh, you know, uh, this is one of, This is one the of the cartoons. biggest things I really wanted to make the book, is that all the cartoons we scanned were like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. It's like, and he uses the word terrorism, like terrorism, terrorism. And in the 70s, 80s, the last cartoon of the book is the religious fanatic with the fanaticism on it, with the guys with the mural face. Like, it's, you can just draw it tomorrow morning. It's yeah. beyond, it's, this is what made me do it, saying the people of my age and younger would relate, yeah, because it relate talks to, to it. this gap. Yeah. Easy. There's something, there's another quote that I'll read now. It's by the editor-in-chief, uh, Khaled Al. Mena, who worked closely with your father at Arab News, mm. and he wrote, Cahill was at heart a humanist. He cared for the poor, the oppressed, and the dispossessed. It did not matter what the ethnic or religious beliefs these people held. In many ways, I, I sort of think of your father's work as quite populist in its mm. outlook, and it provided a uh, platform for, you know, for for the, first, the sentiments and the frustrations mm -hmm. of ordinary Arabs. Mm -hmm. And I think for someone working at, in the decades that he was working in the 70s, 80s, even before that, um, up into 2000, you know, I feel this is a kind of radical departure because, um, you know, official culture in the Middle East was, was government, <coughs> mainly government controlled. Maybe not so much in, in Lebanon, but in uh, all throughout the region. And again, like official culture was always sort of presented in a in proper Arabic. It was, you know, you had to be a public intellectual, you had to be a certain person of standing. Mm. There was all that pressure. And then, you know, cut to 2011, suddenly it's all these all these a multitude of narratives, and it's sort of the rise of the street, the Arab street. Mm. And I kind of feel that your father's work um, even though he, he, you know, he died in 2003, and then he, he was didn't see him, but he he used like a, a lowbrow art form to really communicate. And he pushed a lot of the youth. You have a lot of kids in the cartoons, a lot of the Arab kids who are gonna grow. You know, when he does about the kids, there's a lot of this. Uh, there was only one book published to cover his cartoons, and that was the bestseller in the Middle East for so many years. Oh, see that's wonder. See that's wonderful. I mean, uh, that he really had. He really had like the. Uh, the he was a popular. He, Definitely, he was, uh, the people popular, loved reading him because they would. It, it wasn't a taboo to read it, but there was so much information in it, so it was a good weapon in a way. So you him. you've initiated a, or the family has initiated an award in your father's name. Yes. Well, you basically we were we were yet yeah, to summarize everything now because uh, we're, we're I was trying getting people. To yeah, but, uh, yeah, of course. But about the award, um, basically AUB, the American University of Beirut, uh, with the support of a lovely gentleman who is an art collector called Mr. Sawaf, he has initiated a cartoon award. He's a collector of cartoons around the world. And he wanted to do a comics 
uh, award for Le the Lebanon, held by the AB, having my dad been a dropout from AB. And, uh, and he didn't last, I think. How long did he stay? He was like a swimming teacher for like two years, getting an A or something. Oh. Yeah. No, I didn't. It's not a real business course. It was, only one <laughs> it was <day>. doing business. <laughs> like, well, it's good that he dropped out. <laughs> and he got an award in his name from the same uni, which is even <laughs> more funny. <laughs> so basically, this award is going to be uh, given to six different categories in children's illustrations, editorial cartoons, graphic design. Um, I'll be very bad. I forgot them. But anyway. I have the booklets. Please, I'm going to give them to you to give them to the different people you know who might be Arab cartoonist or talented people who might benefit from this award. So we have the award. I can give you some of the booklets So this is for the that. first year of the award? This is the first year. Right. It is called the Mahmoud Kahil Award. Mm -hmm. It is going to be uh, given at AB in a big party in November. There have been a lot, almost around 100 or 200 entries already now. Now we're ending. The, the end of the award is next week. That's like, wonderful. And there is no country banned from the award. All of them are in the awards. And it's going to be given to the best in each category for the Arab cartoonists. And it's the first ever. So I'm happy that it's in his name. No, and he wonderful. would love to be helping young, new talents. So let's see how the award will go, but you can follow. Well, I was going to ask both of you this question, like what lessons do you think a younger generation, I mean, especially now, uh, post-Arab Spring Awakening, there's been such a rise in visual culture, and there a lot of people are doing cartooning, they're also doing graffiti. It, it is about the street, you know, that these, mm -hmm. that these voices that weren't heard before are now really being heard. But what are some of the lessons do you think that the younger cartoonists or comic strip makers or illustrators can glean from your father's work and Kahil's work? What they need to do is to find the income stream. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid. I think it is, it is, it is as brutal as that. Yeah. <coughs> I think that um, <coughs> there are very few of us who make a living. Yeah. Your father made a living, I make a living. Um, I'm very lucky. To yeah. away with that. I know that uh, there are some very, very good cartoonists out there and who I'm constantly imploring editors to use, and they choose not to. Um, however, I come from a pre-digital age. I'm a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. you know, I, um, I'm dealing with kids who have a portfolio which is viewable by um, three billion people. Yeah. Potentially, it may only ever be visited by 12, but it is potentially visible mm. by 3 billion people. And um, there are a lot of people who are now getting into visual satire uh, in the evening. They finish their day job and then they actually get on with the serious stuff of their lives. They're sort of doing the day job to pay for the serious stuff, which yeah. is actually doing the visual satire. Yeah. And suddenly they can have it as a, it, it can go viral, it can do extraordinary things which uh, when I was their age, it couldn't. I had to send stuff made out of paper, remember that? Um, to offices where an art director would open the envelope and go and throw it away. Yeah. Well, uh, we're gonna start moving yeah. towards a conclusion. I wanted to say, I can remember a time, um, not so long ago, when there were only one or two books about the history and development of Arab editorial cartoons and comic strips uh, published in English. And now, because of 2011, you know, young people have been rediscovering the power of the barbed image. And visual culture has really emerged as a way of gaining insight into uh, a region as politics and government you know, fail so badly. But I think you can find no better guide than according to Cahill. And this compendium of uh, his work is, uh, is hilarious, smart. It shows the Middle East in ways that we haven't seen or we haven't really looked closely. And it's all there. And he was, you know, and he was drawing from the past and speaking to us now. Um, and also that work really does take the pulse of the Arab street. And I want to congratulate you. you for the publication of the book. And also to congratulate the book's editors. Um, we have Desi Pontikos with us tonight. And also Zaki Mahfoud. And also, thank you, Martin, for joining us for this celebration of a wonderful book. So everybody, get your copy. Mm -hmm. Thank you.